she gets kicked out and has trouble with her internet. There she is. There she is. Okay. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to get started. Um, welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting. We are recording Tuesday, January 12th, 2021 at 630. It's our regular business meeting with an executive session to follow. Um, for a roll call, Heather Altenberg is here. Kimberly Carr. Here. Phil Saucier. Here. Elizabeth Seifries. Here. Cynthia Volts. Here. Jennifer McVeigh. Here. Laura Danino is not here yet. Joey Labry, our student rep. Here. And our other student rep, Ellie Gagney. Here. Great. If we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, just to let people know, um, because I've been told that if you are an attendee, you're not aware, we have 16 panelists right now and nine attendees in the meeting. Um, that does sometimes fluctuate, people come and go, but that is what we have right now. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? No. Okay. See none. May I have a motion for approval of minute, minutes, excuse me, for December 15th, 2020? I'll make a motion to approve. Go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. Go ahead, Phil. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, make a motion to approve the minutes of December 15th, 2020. Thank you. May I have a second? Jen, thank you. Uh, any, I second it. Okay, any questions or comments? All right, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jen McVeigh? Yay. Laura Danino? Not here. Okay. Next on the um, agenda is comments from the public. Um, and before we start the comments from the public, I just wanted to remind everybody of our policy that comments are, um, are about things, items that are on the agenda. There is a three minute uh, timed limitation. Um, we do a lot about 20 minutes overall for comments. And if it goes beyond the 20 minutes and the, bo the board decides as a group, if we want to extend it. Um, I haven't been doing this much lately, but I'm gonna try to remember this more often To um, It was easier for some reason in town hall. When you do speak from the public, if you can say your name and where you're from, um, that would be great. Uh, before we get started with it, I would like to just speak for a moment about items on the agenda and public comment. Um, there have been some emails coming in um, of people clearly wanting to voice their opinion and um, it's sounding like there's a little bit of frustration around the limitation for um, being able to speak only to items on the agenda. Um, and that is because we have a lot of work that we need to accomplish during these, um, during these meetings. The agendas are created very specifically. Um, we like to keep them within two hours. If you would like to present to the school board, it is an opportunity for the public to uh, write an email requesting um, uh, to present um, 
and then the board the board chair can decide to put it on the agenda or not um, and that would be a presentation um, it's not a conversation type thing but like other presentations we've had i'm thinking of the exam we had the energy and explain what they've done um, and presentation um, those requests for budget to happen 10 days before prior to the meeting. Um, so I just wanted to offer that as an opportunity. Another way to communicate, which may not seem as gratifying, but I do guarantee that we read them carefully and thoroughly. Um, there's discussion behind the scenes about the emails that happen. I know I speak with the superintendent often about them um, and hopefully, um, we respond in a timely ma manner um, and um, you get that response. So that all being said, um, I'm moving over to attendees and I'm not as smooth with all this, but I try. Are there any individuals that would like to speak to the public? And I may be saying your name wrong, but Alana, do? I'm gonna allow you to speak and you have three minutes. I hope I said your name correctly. Thank you, yes you did, can you hear me? I can, can you just state your address please? Yes, it's uh, 56 Stonegate Road in Cape Elizabeth. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So my comments tonight are pertinent to the agenda topic that one of the school board's goals this year are maintaining and improving the high quality of education for every student. Um, so hi, everyone. Just a brief introduction. My name is Alana Du. Thank you. You did pronounce my name right. Um, I'm first and foremost the mom of three CAPE students, two at Pond Cove and one at the middle school. Um, I am also the wife of a wonderful ed tech at Pond Cove, um, the daughter of a beloved longtime Pond Cove guidance counselor, and I'm a graduate of CAPE High. Um, professionally, I have a uh, PhD in cognitive neuroscience specializing in the study of human learning and memory. Um, and I currently work as a medical research scientist working with FDA clinical trial data. Um, I share all of that tonight to help convey from the start all the perspectives I consider in my analysis of our current situation. I come here with a deep seated respect of this community, knowledge of and respect for science and health and a personal commitment to my family and my children's education. With this in mind, I'd like to share my concerns over the long-term impact of deficits in this year's curriculum. Our teachers are working incredibly hard to support their students amidst the reality of the pandemic, but they're under enormous stress every day as they watch many of their students struggle despite their efforts and creativity. I'm concerned about what the expectations will be of these same teachers next year when they are required to adjust their curriculum for an incoming class of students who will arrive with a fraction of what they normally would have learned in the preceding year and a half. Take any grade level. How will next year's incoming fifth graders, for example, fare with adjusting to middle school without the typical fourth grade preparedness, which itself began after a reduced fourth quarter of third grade? I fear we are creating a monumental burden on next year's teachers to make up for this year's challenges. When it comes to learning, falling behind is a complex problem that is not only about academic content, but goes hand in hand with reduced academic motivation, reduced self-esteem and reduced social development, not to mention increased stress and increased isolation, a worrisome combination that I'm so disheartened to see occur in my own children. And at a community level, falling behind doesn't happen equally across students and neither does the prospect of catching up. Accordingly, the divide between those families who have access to significant private help for their kids and those who do not is magnified. But our community is so fortunate to have a large number of voices, including parents, grandparents, teachers, school nurses, and others who have valuable input, ideas, and experiences to share. My ask tonight is for the school board to establish a dedicated subcommittee in which these voices can be heard. In my opinion, an online survey asking a handful of questions about preferences for next year is just not enough. The clock in this school year is ticking away and we urgently need much more than a business as usual approach. A dedicated subcommittee inclusive of more voices focused on discussing what we can do additionally or differently to support school staff and support le student learning while working within CDC guidelines can only increase the chances for beneficial productive outcomes. 
At last month's school board meeting, a request for such a forum was Alana, made. I have to ask you to sort of sum it up. It's past three minutes, please. Okay. Yeah, okay. that was that was pretty much it. I was just going to reiterate that, to my knowledge, a request was made but not addressed. Um, prioritizing public safety and having the opportunity for back and forth discussion are not mutually exclusive concepts. Um, and if the formation of such a subcommittee is something that the board is not able to accommodate, I would respectfully request to know the reasons why not. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, Roger Rio, you have been unmuted and should have the ability to speak. Thank you. I'm going to say some of the same things as Alana do, um, but I'll try to summarize where I can. Uh, <clears throat> first, thank you all for your uh, efforts in this very challenging time. Uh, I am Roger Rio. I live in Five Bridal Pathway. Great. Roger, can I interrupt you for one second? Sure. Because my role as a board chair, um, and I apologize if I did not um, explain that at the beginning, but one of the other pieces our policy is to not try to repeat what other people have said. So if you have new information to share, um, and I know that our um, our budget goals are in there, but that is really kind of about the budget and less about um, the education. It's more about how the finances around the education work. So if you have something new, to speak, please feel free to add it around the agenda, but um, please refrain from repeating. I will, I will, do. I will, I will, I will try to do that. Let me just give you a little okay. bit of perspective. Um, Great. Um, I've been, we've been in town for 46 years. We've raised five children and attended the schools and I have two granddaughters who are in currently in eighth and 10th grade. Um, while tutoring my, my 10th grade granddaughter, I realized that her time on any given such subject is much less than it was last year. This became very clear when she told me that her chemistry class and math class were in hiatus for four weeks while she's taking the other half of her classes. I'm concerned about the momentum loss in that, in that, in that uh, prospect. I also reviewed the last two school board meetings to see just to get a perspective. And there were some questions in the, la in the last two meetings about from the parent, from the students and from some from parents. I'm wondering whether that should be updated. One was about the quality of academic experience and the other was the amount of work assigned to the students. I'm wondering how much curriculum compared to previous years, uh, if their students are in um, class, is this, I'd like some quantitative analysis done about how much of the curriculum is actually being presented. From what I can see, it could be as little as 50%, but you know that may be totally wrong. And so pardon me if that's true, but it looks like it could be significantly less than what they would get in their normal time. I would think that teachers should be able to do to let us let us know what it is that they expect, how much of a textbook they would be expected to, to cover in this year, and particularly in math, which is my background. Normally, they would cover 90 to 100 percent of a textbook. This looks like it would be much less than that. And I would I would also look at this and say, what what are the <clears throat> what are the impact long term, short term, and long term? And I won't repeat what. Alana said, but you know, again, the impact also to AP students, which some of the students mentioned in that last uh, assessment that they looked at. Um, you know, unless and then last year, many students, the AP exams were canceled for some students, or significantly reduced, and it made it very difficult for them to qualify. That has an impact on their college. Uh, entrance sometimes and also credit for future credit for their for the college. They're also, and I won't repeat the other part, but uh, just to summarize, I'm really concerned about the amount of curriculum that's being presented and how much of that will be retained and how much effort families uh, will have to go through in order to make up for some of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, my apologies for interrupting. All right. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I now see Aaron Plummer. 
you are permitted to speak. Hi there. I'm going to keep it brief. I'm sort of at that same stage of the B1 conversation of the budget of just the maintenance to the quality of the education and improving that where we can. Um, I live at 60 Woodland Road. I recently had to move here after the sale of our other rental house, which um, was up right next to the school. We were super happy there. And now we're in a teeny tiny apartment building where my fifth grade son is trying to learn band at 7.45 in the morning when I can't have him playing the trumpet that early, especially where I've just secured housing again. Um, I, like I said, have a fifth grader at Pong, or the middle school and I'll have an incoming kindergarten next year. I'm a full-time single mom who my business had to close due to COVID for quite a while. And I'm sorry that I'm getting emotional, but I, um, I just want, in terms of the consideration of the balancing of the budget and looking at that, um, you know, what we might be able to do for more support for, you know, for instance, my son is doing hybrid and, you know, when he's at school, everything is great. When he's at home, I'm not here. I have to work seven days a week to afford to live in this town. And I grew up here also. Um, I've lived in, I went K through 12 at the high school and I just, I want to see just a little, it's hard. Like I'm looking at the high school being able to sort of just teach on Zoom. Like if the kids are there, they're there. If they're home, they're watching. But for a 10 year old, almost 11, to try and be just, you know, getting that stuff organized. And I've recognized that I, I obviously have a role in that. But like everybody else who's gone through so many massive struggles with the pandemic, like everything that has gone wrong has gone wrong for me and trying to like support him and, you know, do that in a healthy way for everyone. Like I would just like to maybe look at ways that we, we might do things a little bit differently. Uh, the school has been fantastic. This is in no way, I love Cape. I, would be devastated to have to leave here um but it is very expensive and between paying for full-time child care for my other son I I just don't have a lot of extra you know stuff to like get him a tutor or get him that support and the school has been reaching out and been very helpful but you know sometimes I think that um you know just the perspective of people who maybe don't live in single family housing like how things like, you know, a Zoom band class at that early in the morning, like, are impactful, that sort of thing. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Erin. And thank you for um, that honest feedback. Thank you. I am. Um, I'm sorry it has been so tremendously difficult for you. No, 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 no. And I'm sorry, I listened to Alana speak and she graduated a year ahead of me. And I, it was so many like lovely things. And I remember her mom so fondly. Mm -hmm. It's just been a little stressful. Yes. But well, thanks thank for the opportunity to hear me out. Yes. You bet. Um. I'm not seeing any other attendees. We're now up to 12. I'm just taking a second to look to make sure that if somebody wants to raise their hand. Okay, so moving on, thank you for those who spoke. Moving on, we have comments from student representatives. Okay, let me just pull it up. All right, so first I'm gonna take it away with the club and organization report. Um, so what we have starting is starting with Junior Student Council and they are working on a sweatshirt fundraiser currently. We're selling crewnecks and hoodies with the CE logo to the community. Prom has sort of been put on the back burner because we can't really make many decisions until a little closer. 
So we see what's going on with COVID. And then Senior Student Council just wrapped up a candle fundraiser and they're working on COVID friendly senior activities. Before Christmas, they were able to go to Thompson's Point for ice skating and they are now discussing a possible ski night at Shawnee Peak. Other than that, they're beginning to look at their senior banquet, but still need to talk to the group that plans project, project grad, the school board, Mr. Shedd, et cetera, regarding if it is a possibility. They are hosting a class of 2021 virtual polar plunge to fundraise for project grad. And they're hopeful with the vaccine coming out that they will be able to have project grad in some way. Volunteer club is collecting winter clothing for Purple Street until February 12th. And SAFE, which I was a part of uh, last year, it's Sexual Assault Awareness for Everyone, will be holding their fourth conference about sexual assault awareness at CEHS, hopefully next spring. And Joey's gonna do the rest. So just looking at some academic topics, we've moved into our new mini term, what Mr. Shedd likes to call mini term 2B. I am a fan of that name, so thank you for coining it. Uh, so I'm not hearing any big complaints or any issues from it. Uh, the concerns brought up at the last meeting are still pertinent. However, uh, nothing, no new information to report uh, regarding that system. And then the biggest concern I've been hearing about is the college board's decision to uh, do a full AP test and not shorten it due to our, our reduction in curriculum time. So that's been a concern among the students. I've gotten some information about that kind of piecemeal from uh, different members of staff. So I think the students would really appreciate it if administration could uh, send out some information about how about the current situation and uh, the different solutions that the administration is working towards uh, to ensure that students can perform well on the AP exams this year. And if I may, I'd like to read a statement from the student body into the record. In conjunction with the school board and superintendent of Cape Elizabeth, the student body, as well as I, strongly condemn the insurrection against the United States on January 6, 2021. Regardless of political opinions or affiliation, we are all Americans. The actions that took place on that day are against our core American values and have no place in our society. American democracy remains strong. American democracy will endure. We cannot allow the momentary political moment, momentary political passions to divide us for a lifetime. We must come together and we must come together as Americans. Thank you. And that will conclude our student report. Do the boards uh, members have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you for that statement. There are no presentations tonight for administrative reports. We've got the principals. Oh, welcome, Laura. Uh, we have principals. Um, Jason, do you want to get started with Conco? There you are. Sure, <clears throat> excuse me, sure. Would you like me to start, Heather? Sure, that'd be great, thanks. Thank you, yes. Um, so good evening and thank you for the opportunity to um, speak tonight. Uh, what, um, we were asked to share uh, some highlights of our um, building level strategic plans this evening, which align with um, the district level strategic goals. So what I'm going to do, um, I'll just start with a little bit of process. So uh, we've been working on uh, our building level goals and, and working to align them to the district goals uh, for a, about a month now. Um, and so we've designated um, a staff meeting to this and we've done some other work through Google Docs, collaborative work um, throughout the past few weeks. So what I'm gonna do tonight, it's quite a lengthy document and I'm just gonna share um, uh, each, each, um, the, na the, the nature of each goal and, um, some highlights, just a few action steps though. I will be leaving a lot out tonight, um, just out of respect for everyone's time. So 
I'll go right, I'll get right into it. So our first um, environmental responsibility goal, um, and I won't repeat the district goals because I know that the board knows them and they are accessible um, to the public as well. Um, but for environmental responsibilities um, for P Pond Cove staff, um, we have created a goal in that all students grades K through four will participate in learning opportunities centered on building environmental awareness. Um, so it'll be um, a part of the curriculum this year for all Pond Cove students. And one highlight that I have um, is what our fourth graders will be doing. Um, this is something new for this year. Um, fourth grade students will participate in the New England Aquarium Virtual Academy um, to learn about being an ocean protector and learning um, how animals adapt to survive. And it's, we're excited about this. Um, it's, a, it's a new initiative and it's made possible through a CEEF grant, which um, our fourth grade teachers um, wrote a grant for and, and, received, um, and received. So this is a new exciting opportunity um, provided by our fourth grade teachers and CEEF. So, and I'll move on now to, and I said, said there are action steps for all grades, but I'm just going to share some highlights. Our global competency goal. Um, so in alignment with the um, district global, uh, global competency goal, um, our staff has been very interested and passionate about forming basically like a subcommittee. So Pond Cove now, it was our goal to um, develop a DEI building level committee to support the work of the district level committee really go hand in hand and um, so we have formed that committee and a couple of our action steps that we're we're particularly excited about um, is we're going to be um, having a book study and there's there's a lot of interest um, in the book study staff are signing up and we're going to be starting that soon so it's really um, again, following the lead of the district committee and we're excited about engaging in this work. And just to give you a little update on, okay, our health and well-being. So uh, what we have um, committed to do this year is to um, utilize research-based programs and continue using research-based programs um, to develop physical health and social emotional health. And the highlight I'd like to share is that we're continuing our work um, in Responsive Classroom, which is an initiative that started uh, a few years back, I think three or four years back. Uh, and um, so Responsive Classroom is really, it's implemented in all our classes and it's a focus on uh, building positive communities. So we're really continuing to emphasize that and uh, we're going to continue staff training um, in responsive classroom. And um, our staff, even given pandemic and the limited time we have for PD, uh, our staff is still prioritizing that this year. And finally, multiple pathways. So uh, what we, we're committed to, um, you know, the best we can continuing this year, even in the pandemic with professional development. Um, and in terms of multiple pathways, uh, we are, you know, we're, uh, we focus our PD on um, curriculum and instruction practices, which allow for differentiation, um, which allow for multiple definitions of success. And a highlight from that is that this year our kindergarten through fourth grade teachers will continue to receive professional development in the teacher's college writing curriculum, which is um, really um, the framework is, is um, conducive to differentiation and students being taught where they're at um, and in really um, having that multiple definitions of success in the classroom every day during writing. So those are just some highlights. Just want to really um, show you that, uh, kind of showcase a little bit of the work that's been done in a very short time, um, you know, th this fall and early winter um, on developing goals and starting to work toward them. And I don't, does the board have any questions? Anybody that would like to ask Jason a question? I don't have a question, but it sounds like um, like some real positive stuff 
um, happening at Pond Cove and, and I always appreciate the update. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Jason. And yes. I agree with you, really. It's great to, to see the work of um, pulling things together, so to speak, you know, and having things uh, coordinate district goals with building goals, applying to the strategic plan that was based on the will of the community for the most part. So thank you. Uh, Troy. Hi, everybody. So we at the middle school, um, yeah, this, this was a really good ex process for us to go through. Um, we were able to break out into groups and, you know, um, in some subgroups and come together. And the discussion groups were about groups of about eight teachers. Um, and what I found interesting in just listening to Heather's comment and Kimberly's comment, even working in the building, it's really kind of helpful and refreshing to sometimes, you know, maybe not have the opportunity, but to be kind of forced to sit down and reflect on everything that you already do. Um, and it's really um, nice to know that the work we've been doing kind of aligns with what the community wanted, you know, and, and what would eventually become our goal. So a lot of this stuff um, really is, is truly happening now. And I think it was really a healthy conversation to have a few minutes to not think about COVID or Zoom meetings or any of that stuff, even though we were doing it through Zoom, um, but it was not the topic of our discussion. So, so that was all helpful. Um, so really quickly, I'm a, we have a pretty long document as well. Um, and much like Jason, I'm just gonna kind of share the action steps under each and a little bit of what we call the evidence um, of those action steps. So um, for multiple pathways, our first action step that was agreed upon was um, experiential learning and the evidence for multiple pathways, experiential learning, the evidence for that was um, curriculum driven by real world experiences. That's a goal that we have. We've been working on it. It's starting to spread a little bit, I feel like throughout the school. Um, include more project-based learning and it creates link and really focus on creating links to our community um, through that process. So I feel like we've made some progress. I think this year kind of got in the way slightly of it and it limited a lot of the community outreach because we're so limited to our cohorts and, and potting. But so that was, that was stuff that we really have some movement towards. The next action step is to continue moving towards proficiency-based education. Um, the grade six moved to the four point grading scale. Um, so now fifth and sixth grade both are, are on that current grading scale. And we've had to sit down and have some real hard conversations about redo policies and, you know, retakes and remakes. And, you know, is it a zero or is it a 50 if the work's not done? And, and how does that impact it, a, a student's learning? And what motivates students and how do we do that? So those conversations are continuing. Um, and I think they really fall into the multiple pathways heading. Um, a lot of education around what alternative assessments and how we can assess things differently um, as opposed to just pencil and paper for some students that, and how do we really get to what, what students know. And really a, a really important part of this step was the idea of school um, level meetings to unify and agree upon the standards. We have standards, we agree upon them, but are we really aware grade level to grade level, step to step, how they're how they working, how they're being taught, and are we doing the assessments in a common way? And then the third action step um, was new courses. So how can we start to create new courses at the middle school level? How can we create, and do they all need to be a year? Can they be semesters? Can they be, you know, what, is, what can that look like? Um, and we even started that a little bit this year with planning for success classes. We kind of just picked a name and that's what it became, but it's really talking about how do we, how do we, um, take what students have learned in our classes and then kind of wrap it all up and, and challenge them to think a little bit about a problem or a situation and then do have an opportunity to do some public speaking, um, you know, research, writing, um, argumentative writing, and really work on some of where do we display the skills that we've been gathering over, you know, the first eight grades of school and how can we start to ask kids to show that a little differently. Um, so that's kind of down the road, but it's definitely a direction we're moving in. And then next, um, and I get it on my phone, so I got to try to read it and squint, but it's 
environmental responsibilities. This one is a lot of topics and it's pretty important and pretty clear that in Cape, um, the environment plays a pretty big role living on the coast and where we are, it distinct is a lot of opportunity. So the first one is action step is to expose students to environmentally um, responsible activities. And some examples of that are the eighth grade beach cleanup, the sixth, sixth grade did trout release last year, seventh grade invasive species with um, GMRI, fifth grade lobster labs, oceanography, sustainable local foods. Um, so all of those things are currently happening. And I think this is kind of an inspiring way to think about huh, how do we expand these and, wh and what do we do? Um, the second one is to build a, a curricular guide for environmental stewardship. Because as we were sitting there brainstorming, it became very clear that we all were not aware of what everybody does. And um, so one, one topic is gonna, one, one action step is gonna be creating a kind of a handbook, so to speak, of what actually does take place throughout, in our school throughout a year. Um, do the eighth grade know what the fifth grade does is, and, and how that all works? So I thought that was a pretty seemingly simple, but I think it's gonna be a really informative step. And then the last one, last action step was to work with state and local organizations to provide educational supports to build community relationships. Um, and some of those, some of those outside agencies that we've formed pretty strong bonds with really are um, CELT and GMRI and Shawanki and the Portland Water District, Inland Fishery Wildlife, the Cape Farm Alliance. So those are all outside groups that we bring in and partner with um, to talk about the environment. So that is environmental responsibilities. And next, I'm going to go to health and well being. And for health and well being, the first action step was this year we were excited that we were able to um, offer mindfulness instruction um, to the community and students and families. And that's really through a grant, it's at no cost to the district. And um, so we have a person for three days a week to support that. Um, and really, we are. It's really in a, we're at a stage of gathering feedback and, and really seeing the results. You know, how does this help and impact our kids? The second action step is really the whole focus around mental health awareness at the middle school. And that has, is largely the Yellow Tulip project has, is gonna be something that continues and we do and it's a whole school effort. Um, but there's also things like the poetry slam and PD day around mental health the whole day. And that's a two day planting for all students and staff. Videos were sent out to families, um, photos are shared on the website and students get to, to plant tulips. Um, I think that's been a really strong, it's becoming part of our school and who we are. And then the third action step is social emotional learning curriculum in collaboration with teachers. Um, and that's lessons, materials, uh, working working with our guidance department, our social workers to kind of inform some of the regular instruction that goes on in our classrooms and, and how can we support that. So that is, I think pretty much it. Did I miss one? Maybe global competencies. I don't know, I feel like I missed one. Global competencies, I think that it is. And action step one is to develop a school-wide plan much like Jason's focused on anti-racism um, and the evidence is, a, is the middle school um, DEI task force members kind of leading a little bit of the charge in um, recruiting and, and kind of really just making, providing access for other staff to kind of join in with them. Um, sometimes forming another committee is not what people want. They just want to know who they can go to and have conversations when they, when they need to. Um, planning to include all staff and students in the future and the formation and execution of, of book clubs and book groups for staff as well as students, which is kind of a, is new for us. Um, another action step is to develop a plan for school, community and civic engagement and volunteer opportunities, connecting them to global citizenry and personal responsibility. Um, some evidence of that is the beach cleanup, um, the trail work, interact with senior citizens. Um, they, they totally love those kind of trips. Um, and the senior citizens love, love having us there. Peer helpers, I know we volunteer at the food pantries and we work with, with all of those. So um, a lot is actually happening. And some of the things this year, we going through this process, you realize how much contact you have within your community when you're kind of not allowed to have it. So um, it's, it's been a little bit of a different year right now, but I think moving forward, people are really excited for these goals. And I think they're goals that match what we do. 
which is always really nice. So any questions? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Troy. I think it's always an amazing activity to be able to reflect. And I think it's always good to be able to have on the shoulder when you see what you're doing. So I'm glad that that felt like an exercise that allowed that to happen in part. Yeah, it's very easy to move forward and never take the time to reflect. And when you reflect, I think is when you can grow. So um, it's been, yeah. it's, it was a really nice opportunity. And it's, it seems like a nice way to organize all of what you're doing and, and explain all of what you're doing through the lens of the strategic goal plan, the strategic goals. So thank you. Heather, could I just- um, um, Jeff. Oh, sorry, Kimberly, I didn't see you. Go ahead. Oh, that's all right. Um, I just, um, it, I find it um, just very energizing and inspiring hearing, um, hearing about all the great things that, that are happening at, at both schools. And for, um, you know, for a moment, it's very easy to forget that we're in a pandemic and, um, and you know, it, it almost seems like we're just talking about great education for our students, um, which is, um, I think, just so impressive that that's able to happen on top of the all the challenges that um, that are being faced this year in delivering education to our kids. Um, so thank you for that, and um, and I um, I love just the acknowledgement that that maybe not all the grades are aware of what everyone's doing and figuring out ways to to improve those things. So thank you. Okay, now Jeff, thank you for that, Kimberly. So good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit less comprehensive than Troy and Jason, and and focus on just a couple of, of things that we're doing. We do have a draft three-year plan for three years worth of action steps connected to the strategic plan. We've talked about it once as a faculty. We're coming back to it next week, um, and. I'll share some general thoughts about it and some general directions, but one of the things I've learned as principal as I've done it is if I get too far ahead of the teachers, I get myself in trouble. Um, so I'm gonna focus a little bit and I'm also gonna do something that I don't do with board reports. I'm not sure I ever have before. And that is I, I wrote something down. So I'm gonna, and I'm gonna take a bit of a circuitous path to uh, their strategic plan, but I'll get there. Um, this year, I've had the great privilege of teaching a government class to a group of seniors. They are a great group, um, and they have absolutely been a highlight of my year. We started this year in my class talking about the concept of rule of law. It's the idea that no person is above the law, and all people are equal in its eyes. It's a fragile concept, and it's critical. And our struggle to live up to that principle of the rule of law has been on full display this year from a curbside in Minneapolis where a black man was choked to death by a person sworn to uphold the law to the entire period from November 3rd onward during which the president of the United States, another person sworn to uphold the law has led a massive gaslighting campaign to undermine faith in our presidential election. This may sound like a political statement, it is not. The president's team challenging the election is roughly zero for 60 in, in its efforts at litigation. That's pretty conclusive and pretty factual. Every time the team is invited to bring forward evidence of fraud, they either dismiss the claim before they have to do that or their evidence is found laughably wanting. I take encouragement from the 0 and 60 record, because that record of losing means the rule of law is alive, albeit not well in this country. Arnold Schwarzenegger shared a viral video that many of you have probably seen. He draws on his Austrian background to show how authoritarianism often begins by attacking the very idea of truth. Hannah, Hannah Arendt, the German historian of the 20th, of 20th century totalitarianism, captured the same idea in these two quotes from her book on totalitarianism. The result of a consistent and total substitution of lies for factual truth is not that the lie will now be accepted as truth and truth 
be defamed as a lie, but that the sense by which we take our bearings in the real world and the category of truth versus falsehood is among the mental means to this end is itself being destroyed. In an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point in those totalitarian societies she was describing where they would at the same time believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and nothing was true. Undermine the very idea of truth and it's so much easier to convince a lot of people that a fair election was unfair. So here's, where I'm, here's why I'm mentioning this tonight because I it's reflecting on the events of the past couple of months, it's led me to realize that our students need to be taught to be, need to be taught better, uh, to be critical consumers of information, much more explicitly and much more comprehensively than we are now doing. This goal is actually uh, tied to our global citizenship goal. A project for us as a school system is to learn how to do that. So we're playing our part in making our democracy more resilient than it lately appears to be. We have to teach students and then give them lots and lots of practice. We all do some of this in our schools, in our respective schools, but not systematically. I don't have the answer to this. It's not part of our action plan. I don't have a formula for what this needs to look like, but it is a huge issue so that our graduates are armed against powerful liars of all political persuasions and against the frequent idiocy and random cruelty of social media that cares everything about clicks and very little about truth. I wanted the board to hear that and I know you will share the same concerns. I'm gonna to get to the strategic plan in a minute, but this is an even more of a detour. I wanna thank for the umpteenth time this year, Karen Jenkins, Jill Young and Aaron Taylor just today, we had to deal with another community transmission case that affected our school. The way they pitched in as a team was remarkable. I can't say thank you enough to them. As a school, we are working on action steps aligned to the district strategic plan. We have lots of things and a lot of conversations going on this year concerned with the topic of race and racial justice. I wanna thank Nate Carpenter and English teacher Liz Yarrington in particular for starting a series of conversations that are and will continue to bear fruit. There are other things in this area that are underway and other ideas that are percolating, including book groups for both, parent, or for both students and staff. We are focusing a lot of attention on the goal of alternative pathways. We are kicking around ways to beef up our ability to individualize for our square students who don't fit into our round holes. To this end, we are thinking of repurposing and reframing some staff members already in the building, including Achievement Center staff. No specific plans yet, ideas percolating, the ideas are simmering, once again, led by Nate Carpenter. Connected to this work, we are definitely looking forward to getting back the position of extended learning opportunity teacher that is in this year's budget, but not hired because of completely valid COVID related budget concerns. I want you to know that that position and the other position that was funded but not filled this year for a part-time aid in the library are top priorities for me, at least coming into this budget year. So that's about it. We're in many terms session 2B now. I'm glad you like that name, Joe. <laughs> um, our first semester ends Friday, February 5th. I did a survey of teachers, as Joe and Elise did a survey of students. Teachers' reaction to the change from one mini term to the next was nearly identical to students. Overall, they perceived the shift as pretty seamless. There was a learning gap, and Roger Rio and others have talked about that, and teachers and students have worked hard to fill those gaps. Many were skeptical about the mini terms at the beginning of the year, and I was far from sure about it myself. And it seems to me that most have come around. And again, with today's COVID related events, I think we also have seen the benefits of the mini, that mini term approach one more time. Um, regarding AP exams, I wasn't gonna talk about it, Joey, uh, but I'll just mention it. The college board has said so far that, that students are gonna be tested on the full curriculum. Um, 
they have also said, but they haven't yet uh, released details that we will be able to uh, administer the test to students in either late May or early June as alternative test dates, which will assist to some extent uh, with gaps. I suspect we will also during the last too many terms of the year be having teachers doing some systematic connection with students outside of the specific mini term when their classes are meeting to try to address some of those concerns. Um, the, school, the college board is expected to release details of its plan in early February, but I can certainly get out to teacher, to students and parents, the information that we have to the extent that we have it and the general concepts of what we're thinking about anyway. So that's AP exam. So that's it. Thank you. Kimberly. Um, I, I recognize you weren't going to speak on this, so you, <laughs> you may not want to answer questions on it. But, um, but as far as the AP exams go, it seems as though much of the country is in, uh, you know, similar learning situations. Um, I, I, do you have any understanding of their rationale in moving ahead with the Full test. So I actually had a conversation with Pat Doyle, who's the College Board Regional Coordinator for New England. She's based in, in Boston. I, I talked to her over the winter break and, and raised this question. And what she said, and I, I have no reason to, to, to doubt it, is she said that the College Board is feeling some heat from colleges that if they are going to hold out the prospect of students getting either advanced course standing or college credit for the courses that they're taking in high school, that to them it's important that the exams reflect um, the full scope of the courses that are planned, Kimberly. Um, having said that, and I, I, the, the, the reality is that the, the, the assessments are graded by humans and the cut points are graded by, are determined by human beings. Um, so I am, to some extent, they try to be as objective as they can, but to some extent, I think they are probably adjusted to reflect the realities of the, the test results they have in front of them. Um, but you're right that every place across the country is, is struggling with the same things. We are not in any different situation. We're actually in a much better situation than some schools. Not as good a situation as I'd like to be, but basically our students whether they're home or remote are getting in, in person, not necessarily in school, but in person instruction at least four, day, four days a week with our teachers. Now it is alternating many terms and um, uh, I've talked to our teachers and they expect that there will be things that they will not cover, but they are doing the, bat, the very best they can to cover uh, the most important stuff. And many, many of the AP teachers think they'll be able to cover the vast majority of what the college board curriculum calls for. It's not gonna be easy, but they're working really hard. I think the areas where it's gonna be the most challenging are, are, are math and science, because they are a little bit more content-based, a little bit less, a little bit less skill-based. Um, those are definitely the biggest challenge areas. And that's why I think I wouldn't be surprised if during those last mini terms, we do some adaptations to allow teachers AP teachers at least, and maybe others as well, to do some connecting with students outside of the many terms they're scheduled to teach. That was a long-winded answer. I hope I addressed your question, Kimberly. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I think, um, you know, just on a, on a global level, the inequity that we have in this country right now, you know, we're, we're doing really well compared to a lot of public school systems, and then there's private schools that are doing far better than us. Um, and yeah, anyways, you, you, I don't need to lecture <laughs> you, you on this, but it, it, I find it distressing. So yep. thank you. Yep. Um, Elizabeth has her hand raised. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thanks. Um, I wanted to thank all the principals for getting us up to date on what's been going on with strategic plan goals. And I find it admirable that despite everything else that we know is absolutely crowding your plates and your minds that you're continuing this really important work for the district. Um, and specifically to Mr. Shedd, I really appreciated your quote unquote long winded 
um, approach to telling us about what's going on because you are connecting real world circumstances to our strategic plan goals. And um, I agree that we really need to be working on preparing our students to be educated citizens and scrutinize their information and, and be ready to interact in the world as um, voters and adults. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. I was gonna say something along the lines of Elizabeth, but for sake of time, I'm just gonna say ditto. Thank you. Ditto from me too. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on, we have Marcy Weeks, our business manager. Great, hi everyone. So the okay. primary focus right now is on entering all requested budgets. And we are making progress. And Superintendent Wolfram and I have just three budget meetings left this week with administrators. We spent the last two weeks doing this. And during these meetings, we go over each line item and discuss any changes and any details that need to be covered. So we're making progress. And um, another part of the business office that's happening is February 1st, we will have our new human resources manager starting. So we will have our full staff in place by February 1st. So we're very excited. For the monthly financial report, the percentage of the year that has occurred as of December 31st was 50% of the year. The total general fund expenditures come to 46% at this time. The average percentage spent at this point over the past five years is 47%. So we are right in line with the average for the past five years at 46. The range between what has been spent and the percentage of the year at each point in time since August. So over so since August, every month, we've had a three point range this is the first month that we're seeing a four point range. However, the debt service payments are due the next six months. So we will be at 100% for our debt service payments, which will drive our percentage up and the range will get um, smaller. Um, and that's all I have tonight. Are there any questions? Elizabeth, I see your hand raised, go ahead. Sorry, I was quiet earlier, but I'm ramping up now. <laughs> yeah. um, Marcy, I wanted to ask you, how are we looking um, for building, rebuilding up our unassigned fund balance? Ooh, good question, Elizabeth. Um, it is looking um, very good. We have our audited financial statements that will be presented to you in town council next month in February. And I will have a full analysis prepared for you to explain the fund balance. And we are now, um, at our 3% um, that we were wanting to have, have a, a target. And this will give, yes, you, this will give you and the board all sorts of um, chances to decide what to do going into this budget process in, in case of anything that's happening related to our state subsidy or anything uh, related to the expenditures. So you're going to have some choices that can be made and I'm gonna present um, some options for you all to have in February. So thanks for asking Elizabeth, that's pretty, it's, it's good news um, because I know that we have other school districts around us that um, the auditors were not able to deliver that type of news to. So they assured me that um, this is a, a good position for us to be in. So that's good work on your part and good work on Donna's part too. Thank you so much. Um, the other question I had was around um, trying to be able to encumber our um, project finances before December 31st. This is the first time we've been able to meet since then. So can you and Donna talk a little bit about, did we make it? Yes. <laughs> we, yes. Have good, we have good news. Marcy, go ahead with the good news. Yes, we had good news. We, um, Donna and I didn't really sleep much leading up to December 31st, if you can imagine, because we were um, busy in the business office making sure that everything was encumbered, spent, uh, process paid. And um, we, we had a feeling and we, that, that something would happen, but there was one last little part of our construction project that we got news from the state. We have until now, they have released 
the requirements to be through um, actually expending through June and invoicing. So we, Superintendent Wolfram and I um, got that project completed and underway. And now we are within a, the exact time frame to have the ventilation improvements um, installed probably by, is it March, Donna, from our last meeting? We're looking at March is, yeah, I think is so. the time frame. So we really got lucky with all of our planning and a little bit of luck with that last minute part of our mechanical construction that we needed a little bit of time with, and um, but we got it done. And so we're heading towards that completed, Elizabeth, and the final invoicing will be for that final mechanical construction component within the state timeframe. So we're, we're ecstatic and relieved beyond belief, if you can imagine. We're waiting for the equipment. That's what's holding everybody yeah. up, yeah. but us I yeah. like that too. But we do have some leeway now, so that yeah. is uh, very good news. Fantastic news! Thank you so much. I appreciate hearing about both of those, and I apologize. Usually, I like to give um, Marcy a heads up. Oh no problem. If I'm going to ask something that doesn't seem like right on the agenda, and I did not, but thank you. You guys were both prepared. For no problem. Don and I have been um, living and breathing this particular project so thank you for that thank you yeah. yeah thank you for those great questions too Elizabeth yeah, thank you a reminder to the community anybody else okay thank you Marcy we have Kathy Stanker director of teaching and learning welcome hello hi everybody um I would just like to say they can call it luck but I think we all know um that it was 110% hard work. So um, I just have one announcement to share tonight, which is that the Racial Equity Institute is going to be conducting a three hour training over Zoom with our entire staff on Wednesday, February 3rd in the afternoon. Um, this is an organization that is based in North Carolina. They conduct workshops all over the country and we're very fortunate to have them coming to Cape Elizabeth. Prior to the pandemic, um, Principal Mandarides and Pond Coast School Counselor Bree Gallagher participated in their two-day workshops in Portland. Um, and Bree, who is a member of the District Equity and Inclusion Task Force, has since observed a second workshop. So they are uh, known to us, um, and I think both both Jason and Bree would would strongly attest to their quality. So the training that our staff is going to be participating in is called the Groundwater Approach, Building a Practical Understanding of Structural Racism. And um, I'll tell you that as long as you promise not, Elizabeth to ask me too many questions about this because I haven't been to the training yet. Um, but the term groundwater is drawn from a fish lake groundwater metaphor. The idea is that if one fish is belly up dead in a lake, you ask, what's wrong with the fish? And if half the fish in the lake are belly up, you ask, what's wrong with the lake? But if half the fish in multiple lakes are belly up, then it's time to ask, what's wrong with the groundwater? So we are very much looking forward to gaining a deeper understanding of the underlying causes of racial inequity and to incorporating this learning in our work with students. And if you're interested in learning more, I've posted the groundwater approach brochure, which has more about that metaphor, um, to the District Equity and Inclusion Task Force page, which is on the school department website. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Good work. Good work, all of it. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we have oh, here as the director of special says, Hi, Dell. Hi, Heather. Um, evening, everyone. I just have a couple of things to share with the board. Um, one of them is that Jason Mangerides and I will be meeting with representatives from CDS in the next couple of weeks to review incoming CDS students for next fall's kindergarten class. At that time, we'll also be establishing um, CDS transition dates as well. And um, 
I am uh, continuing to monitor information coming out of Augusta with regard to the possibility of uh, shifts being made with regard to the responsibility for four-year-olds. Um, uh, we've had those conversations before and I haven't heard anything definitive as of yet, but we'll continue to monitor that. Um, we're, con continue, uh, we're currently servicing 174 students in special education. We have 12 students in referral and we currently have one student outplaced. And that's all I have for you tonight. Any questions from the board? Cynthia, Cindy, I'm reading. Hi, Cindy, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a um, question regarding the number of students in referral. And I'm just curious how that compares to a typical school year. If you found, um, what has that process been like this year given COVID and the ability to identify students and uh, work with them in referral? It's actually not, um, it's very similar to a, a regular school year, Cindy. Um, it, um, I wouldn't say that we've had an excessive number of referrals. Um, and um, I think, I mean, each school is doing their best to, you know, maintain those services that we've uh, always been providing with regard to RTI and filling those, uh, addressing those skill gaps as they arise. So um, I think all those pieces are continuing to be in play, even though we're in a hybrid model. So not a big change. Okay. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. Elizabeth, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Del, can you talk a little bit about um, how, and this is very general, not any, no specifics, of course, just how do you feel like students who maybe struggled a little bit last year when we were on full remote. And um, you had talked at the beginning of the school year about getting together with teams and working on um, different plans for students who, who really didn't do well on full remote. And I don't know if you have anything to share with us about how it's going for those students this year so far. So um, I think I've mentioned before, but maybe not. Um, for some of our students, uh, we've worked with building administration, and whenever possible, we've in uh, we've had some students who demonstrated or clearly demonstrated that they're unable to gain any meaningful benefit from uh, remote instruction. That those students are in on all four days, um, and it, each student is looked at individually as to. They may be in on all four days, um, the two non-cohort days being uh, just to receive their services. Other students may be in on all four days and actually um, be attending both cohorts. Um, so we, and this is, so there's modifications going on in every building. Um, and it's, we have many, many students that uh, whenever possible, once we, we identify and have clear evidence that they require um, additional in-person time. We're trying to maximize that to the best extent possible. Does that answer your question, Elizabeth? Yes, thank you for talking about that. So no, I think staff- It helps, um, yeah, it just staff, helps us all understand. Staff and families, uh, we've been working together as a team and uh, um, I can't say enough for both. Uh, parents have been wonderful and flexible and um, have been done a great job in communicating what their children are struggling with and staff have done a wonderful job at being flexible and adapting to those needs as they arise. And the building administration as well have been very flexible whenever possible, of course, as long as we're still following CDC guidelines. Thank you, Dal. Sure. And then Superintendent Wolfram. So I also want to um, thank our nurses for their work today and their continuing work. Um, they just are quite a team and really have a system down and we had quite a bit of work to get through today and um, they were just jumping in and helping each other and it was, it was great to see they're, they're quite a team. So thanks. Thanks to our nurses, they are amazing. 
As Marcy said, we have, um, she and I have been meeting with department heads and administrators to uh, go over our, their original request budgets. Um, and Marcy's been busy entering numbers into those re original request budgets uh, so that we can get some idea of uh, where we are with our, um, with our original request total budget at this point. I don't wanna say final budget because it's far from being final. Um, you, most of you know that um, as we work on developing our now FY22 budget, we still have really many unknowns um, about our budget work. Budgets, uh, the school budget is really based in two parts. One part is the expenditure expenditure part, which we spend a lot of time uh, working on how much do we need to expend uh, to keep our school district going, and then our revenue, the revenue side of the budget. Um, how much are we taking in? How much do we need to take in to match the expenditure side? And the expenditure side has to match the, uh, the revenue side. And we do have um, really some important pieces that uh, are, we end up missing along the way and we, we catch them up as we go on. But one of those things is of course our state subsidy and we are waiting, we wait for that. Um, it should be coming the end of February, but um, that is the best scenario possible. So right now we are not hearing anything out of Augusta about state subsidy. So we have no idea uh, where we are, if we're on track with um, what we sort of usually get as state subsidy, or we were hearing um, last at the, at the end of last year that there would probably be up to 10% cuts in state subsidy. So really um, we have a superintendent's convocation on Thursday and Friday this week, and hopefully we'll hear something, uh, some kind of projections about state sub subsidy, but we really haven't heard anything about that. Another big um, puzzle piece is our health insurance increases. And uh, as you know, we, uh, we don't really hear anything about that from until the beginning of April. So we usually start by putting a percentage placeholder in, and usually that's a 10% uh, percentage placeholder. And then at some point in March, we usually hear what the ceiling of the increase would be expected to be. So um, we sometimes um, can reduce then uh, the placeholder and then Hopefully it's even less than that and we can reduce it again. But uh, those are two huge um, pieces of the puzzle that um, really uh, we, we don't have answers to until the year goes on. Um, it is important to remember that our uh, state subsidy is really based on uh, validation, uh, valuation and enrollment. Uh, what's happening in Maine and uh, probably throughout the country, I guess, is enrollments are going down. Um, parents are uh, homeschooling their students or placing them in private schools um, for this year. And we're, we're hearing, we had, we had some students, uh, some parents who did that, and we're hearing that they're planning on coming back. Um, but unfortunately, that may impact our state subsidy um, when, um, when enrollments go down and negatively impacts our state subsidy. We are hearing that the state is working on some kind of um, adjustment to the funding formula on that, but I uh, haven't, haven't heard anything for sure on that. So uh, more, more to come on, on that. Um, also in January, we, after we start the um, meetings with the department heads and administrators, um, the board uh, identifies their budget goals, which we'll, you'll be working on tonight. So that, that's another piece of the budget uh, that starts in January. So you will be reviewing those tonight. And we, we publish a budget review calendar, which um, is in your supporting documents for tonight. And it lists, <laughs> it lists all of the, um, the meetings that will take place um, from, um, from let's say, I think the beginning of January all the way until when the uh, budget is finally passed 
hopefully passed, um, the beginning of June. Um, so there's a lot of meetings on there, a lot of work to be done, um, but check that budget review calendar and uh, mark those important dates on, on your calendar. Every year at this time, we always provide uh, important historical documents um, that really frame our budget development. And I've sent those out to you. I don't think I'm going to pull those up unless anybody really wants me to, but they are on our supporting documents. Um, one of the documents is a student enrollment uh, sheet based on our October uh, student count, student enrollment counts. And again, those numbers will look down, uh, look like they're down, they are down. Uh, because we have had students who have been homeschooled or enrolled in private schools. Um, we're looking at this as a temp temporary decline in enrollment. And when we plan for the budget next year, we're planning on those students coming back. Uh, so when we're looking at classes, um, we are planning on those students coming back. Um, there is an enrollment compared to professional staffing level uh, sheet, and that shows the number of um, professional uh, staffing uh, staff members that we have uh, with our hybrid and 100% uh, remote learning situations. We have had to hire additional staff. Um, we had the funding for that, um, some of which we're using uh, the, the COVID money. Um, but also, so you'll see our, our staffing is up and our, again, our enrollment is down, but um, that, that is the explanation for that. Um, you'll all see, also see a state education subsidy history and you'll see that um, in the last two years, our subsidy has started going up again. Um, for a while, it was going down, 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 and um, really Cape Elizabeth took quite a hit, but for the past two years, it's going up. Again, no one knows what's going to happen next year, so we're really on standby um, to hear some news about what they're thinking for next year. So I may hear something at the end of this week, I'm hoping, I'm hoping so. And then the last document is the, expen the expenditure pie chart. And it will show you um, how our budget is uh, expended. And it's about 84% goes to um, benefits and salaries. And the next highest um, expenditure is a six is six percent of the budget, and that is uh, expenditures on facility and maintenance. So really, ninety percent is um, if you add those two together, ninety percent is salary and benefits and facilities and maintenance, and that's basically um, what how our budget is expended. Um, The negotiating team of the school board has been working with the teachers association to develop a memorandum of understanding that outlines protocols, practices, and procedures during the pandemic. So this work has been going on since September and we now have reached an agreement um, that will work for both the staff and the school department. So we are in the process of, of getting um, signatures on the MOA. Administrators continue to examine schedules and procedures of both our 100% remote learning model and our hybrid model. We meet every two weeks and we discuss possible tweaks that will benefit our students, families, and the feasibility of any changes that we, um, that we look at. There are many things to take into consideration. Um, again, Today was another example at the high school about the, the schedule, how the schedule has worked for us. We, um, we have not had to lose great numbers of staff to quarantining or great numbers of students to quarantining because of the schedule that um, was developed in September. And while um, students may not be meeting with their teachers as often um, as in a normal year. It is, uh, it is helping keep our staff and our students in school. And uh, again, we, we saw it again today and um, it, it is working 
uh, for the safety of our staff and our students and just for keeping our schools open. Um, schools that have had large numbers of staff having to quarantine have had to close down school. Um, so we have managed uh, mostly to keep our schools open and I really think it's um, due to the, the schedules that have been put in place and the safety precautions. So, so we continue to look at, at that. Um, we, we would really love to have all our kids back in school full time um, and to, to increase the time that students are in school. And we will continue to look at possibilities, uh, any changes in uh, guidance from the main CDC and the main DOE. Uh, continue to listen to ideas of staff and communities, uh, community members. Um, our administrative team has a wealth of knowledge regarding the working of the district and our schools, and we'll continue to use that knowledge to review our current models and feasible ideas for improvement. So, any questions? Okay, as always a lot going on there. Um, Donna, can you just remind me in the public, uh, you referred to the budget um, and how, was it 84% for salaries? Yeah, salaries and benefits. And that's fixed, correct? Yes, yes. Like, that's, you don't yeah. have wiggle room in that because no. it was already negotiated in contracts. Correct. So, okay. So that's just something we can't even no. change. Right, thank you for that. Any other questions? All right, so new, moving on to new business, may I please have a motion? I move we approve uh, the following athletic nominations for diving in the high school Michael Bartley, and for ice hockey girls in the high school, Kevin Joy. May I have a second? Second. I'm not sure who said that. Thanks, Cindy. Oh, okay, thanks, Cindy. Um, any questions or comments? And so I just want to clarify, Donna, if you can remind me, though the sports are not actually happening right now, there are um, in the competition or practice level, there are coaches that are doing work and communicating with students. And so they are getting paid an amount based on the amount of work they're putting in. And that's why we need to hire winter coaches. Right. And we're hoping, we're hoping that we get back into green. And we're hoping we get back in. Okay. Great. Uh, any other questions or comments? Heather Altenberg's a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Bolts. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Delino. Yay. All right, may I have a motion please for item 7B? I move we approve the school board budget goals for fiscal year 22, and we will develop those right now. Great, can I have a second first? I second. Second. I got Laura first, Phil. <laughs> Next time, all right. And so discussion. We had created um, last year uh, four goals, maintaining and improving the high quality of education for every student, careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget, support the current strategic plan goals and clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. Um, board members, it's our opportunity right now to discuss this and see if there's any tweaking we want to do. Elizabeth, I see you're ready to start the discussion. Go ahead. 
So these goals have been our goals for two years in a row, and they have been really good goals that served us well. Um, but I am a proponent of a, a refresh. And um, in that spirit, I went around looking at other school boards goals for their budgets today, because I don't believe that you have to invent something, you just have to implement it and make it better and make it look like yours. So um, I, I wanted to kind of capture some of the spirit of what we're working on now. And um, so I, I developed a list that I just would like to share with the board for their thoughts. Um, so how we could structure it might be like this. So it would say the fiscal year 22 budget will, number one, move us forward with our strategic plan goals. Number two, empower students with the academic, personal, and social knowledge and skills to build balanced and purposeful lives, which is either our mission or our vision. Either way, it, it, it's directly related to our mission, vision, and uh, value statements. Number three, ensure equity and access to opportunities for all CAPE students, which I think is very relevant to DEI and other things we've got going on in our um, district. And then number four is financially responsible. So I did not keep the um, clear and continual communication throughout the budget process because it was, it was an, an, there was a need for that to be um, a very visible goal for a couple of years. And um, I think we have established that tradition. And I don't know, I'm just, I'm just, for me, I don't know that it needs to be in the goals anymore because I think that's one thing that can go into the policy that we're going to develop around our budget process. But also, I think we've we've established that. So that I very type them out and can share them at any time. Yeah, Elizabeth, that sounds very similar to the school board goal that we um, sort of put on the back burner about communication and relationships with town council and feeling like we we achieve that goal and we can always put it back on, but right now it doesn't need to be front and center. Um, and I couldn't agree more with number four. I'm, I'm happy to take that one off um, and use something that might have a little bit more substance to it. Um, so, so I see some, I really like um, what you said, Elizabeth, and I like that you did some research into other um, schools goals, uh, district goals. So. Thank you for doing that um, homework, if you will. So remind me, so I, I see there's one that's very similar to the strategic plan goals. That's the first one that you read out. That's great. Yeah, it was just move us forward with our strategic plan goals. Perfect, I love that. You have about uh, being fiscally responsible or scrutinizing yep. the budget. Yep. That's the last one. I like that it ends in that, especially when yep. we meet them at the start of the budget meeting. So yep. that's very important, it's underscored. What is the one that highlights our, what our first goal is? Can you read that again? Which is replacing the maintaining and improving the high quality of education for every student. What is the- So I'm not really looking at this list as replacing anyone in particular. I'm just offering it as a, as a new set of goals. Um, but so number two is literally taking, I, and someone can look, um, it's, it's either our mission statement or it's our value statement. Okay. that we developed and it's, you know, it's on every website, every page, everywhere. It's that we, we are going to empower students with the academic, personal and social knowledge and skills to build balanced and purposeful lives. That is our yes. mission statement. And so what I did notice as I looked at several other school boards goals is that their mission statement was part of their goals. <laughs> Makes like, sense. Why would we not do that? And it is, it's the same, it's the idea that we're maintaining and improving, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's put our mission statement in there after our strategic plan. Okay. Um, I see Cynthia's hand, Cindy's hand, that's gonna trip me up for a little bit, um, is raised. I'm wondering, um, Elizabeth, do you have that on your computer accessible if I let you, if I, sh for to share the screen so that those who wanna reread it through conversation or, before you give me the power to share, let me double check. <laughs> okay. Because I might've printed it out and said, nah, I'll just send it in an email and then. <laughs> okay. 
I, I think it might be for some people as we process and talk about this, um, we might be able to, to visually we're losing you, Heather, but I found them. Perfect. You That's a cat. That's not a gold. Are we doing the share screen right now or is it like paused? I'm I'm trying to set Elizabeth okay, up. I just wondered if it, it froze there for a second. It froze. Should I are we should I wait or should I just go ahead and bring up my question? Okay, wait a minute. I think I've got I'm back. Okay. Oh yay. Oh, I'm out. I was trying to set Elizabeth up as a co-host. Oh, there we go. Okay, Elizabeth, you should be able to share now. Can you do it? Okay. While we're waiting though, Cindy had a question. Maybe she can ask it while we're getting these. Oh, oh there. there we go. Question or, or comment or, yeah. Sorry, I had to, <laughs> am I muted still? And if I am? We hear you. I okay. Hear you. It's when I'm, when I've got the share screen, I can't see whether I'm muted or not. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't, I had Zoom locked down in my system preferences because I'm a I'm a little um, tight on security and I had to go in and do all that anyway. So it was just, these are not me forcing on you guys. I just thought it would be a jumping off point for discussion. So my comment, and I know it, um, our facilities are mentioned within the strategic plan, but given, I know our facilities are going to be a big focus moving forward. And I'm assuming we'll um, even just the next steps to getting to um, uh, potential plan for our, our building improvements uh, will probably be a part of this year's budget. Is there is it something we want to call out more explicitly? Or is it enough to say we're moving forward on the strategic plan goals and then a strategic plan goal does say, you know, effective, safe and effective facilities? I guess I'll jump in oh, unless someone else is going to. I, um, I hear what you're saying. And I think that we have called that out in our board goals for the year. And I don't think that strictly in the FY22 budget, we have, I don't know if that's the appropriate place to put that goal. That's just me. I think it's embedded in our strategic plan goals. Okay. 
Yeah, I concur with Elizabeth. And I think um, I, um, by singling out the building, I don't want to devalue any of our other strategic plan goals either. And I also wouldn't want to list them all. So I think, uh, I think your statement there incorporates it sufficiently from my perspective. Do we feel like we're done looking at this? Should I take it down? No, I'm actually still sort of reading over them a few more times, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, it's quiet. I'm just sort of taking it in a little bit. I'm curious of the sort of different structure of it, of FY22 budget will, um, they, they seem like stronger statements as opposed to the school board's goals are. Um, yeah, and I think we can reward, uh, it was it was me trying to find a way to make um, something linguistic happen. <laughs> I trust you on that far more than me. <laughs> um, I, I like this. Um, I, I like the way you bring in the strategic plan goals, which um, are important to have in all that we consider as a board. Um, and of course, financially responsible at the end, that is our role. My, I guess my concern is, is it important to expand on is financially responsible? Is it important to expand on that a little bit to explain what that means to us? Or is it self-evident? Is it enough to just say something as simple as is financially responsible? It's sort of just a question I have. I'm not wedded one way or the other. It's just a, a comment. Um, would it be worth explaining a little bit number four in a little bit more detail? I think it's a very valid point you bring up, Heather. And I'm reading how it was written in our goals that we've used. And I do like the, the additional explanation uh, because this is what we do, careful examination of line items, item by item, line by line, in consideration of the su success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. I'm all for clear and concise. You all know that. But, <laughs> Laura, this one was for you. I know, I know. <laughs> and look at that. But I, I like- No, I hear you. I agree. Behind it to, to, so, so people have perspective. Um, we could easily reword that to say will um, reflect a careful examination of light items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. That's I like great. That. Um, I don't know. Are you able to do that right now, Elizabeth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Provide a, so there we go. Great, beautiful. The other comment I would make is on, on number one, um, rather than move us forward, be specific about us, move the school department, move what, however we want to say, but. What about that? Move CESD forward, yeah. 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 Um, and I have to say, I really like that number three has been added, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm taking a pat on the back for that one. Yeah, you should. <laughs> thank you for having that in the consideration, right? I think that is one of those hard goals right now, but essential, right? If we're trying to have it seep into all we do, if we're trying to um, change things, um, it needs to be in this budget goal as well. 
Yep. Access and opportunity is something that um, yep. is a really big part of what we can do to move the needle in the school yep. department. Yep. So, and I, I really like seeing that. I would say I would give this a thumbs up and I would vote for this um, the way it stands right now. Um, and I want to thank you for the, the background work you did. I can take the little um, scribbles out and notes. And yeah, the little the little notes. That was just for talking purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the prior goal just just again a little word word nitpicky, but um, the prior goal had fiscally responsible budget, and you have financially responsible budget. Right. So we can do. Reference. I mean, I'm. I, I wanted to note the difference. I don't know if. Um, I think I like fiscally responsible better myself. I do too. I'm going to wordsmith it now and let people start yelling at me. No, I agree with Cindy. Good catch. I like it better too. If this is what we go forward with, I will um, email this to Donna and Jen, or Donna, Jen, and Phil, since they will be read at the beginning of every meeting. Is that what? Um, yes. And Donna, are you the host? Kimberly got bumped out. No, you're, and, you're the host. Am I the host still? I think so. I think I got bumped out of being host when I got kicked out. Oh, okay, why not? Oh, I am the host. Yeah, okay. which means you're going to have to then make me the host again like I was before. Sorry about. We just need Kimberly to move over and move in. Okay, now you're the host. Okay, and did we let Kimberly in or do I need to? Um, I do now. Okay. Uh, promote to panelist. I love that power. Promote to panelists. Um, okay. So I think I'm ready to vote. Um, I can't see everybody's faces right now. Um, I'd like to still leave this up for a minute, Elizabeth, while we vote. But if people are not ready to vote, will you speak up since I can't see you all? All right. So then as the... Um, budget goals that we just created now. Maybe you could take them down now, Elizabeth. Oh, yes. And now I can mute myself. <laughs> um, Heather Altenberg is a yay uh, with a lot of gratitude for that pre-work. Kimberly Carr. Yes, also a yay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. <clears throat> Cindy Volts. Yay, and thank you, Elizabeth. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay, and ditto, thank you. <laughs> and Laura Danino. Yay. Okay, great. Heather, if I may just speak up, it was just, um, I wanted to um, support Phil a little bit. This is a big role he's taking on this year, so. Yeah. <laughs> that was my help for him. Thank you, I appreciate that, Elizabeth. All right, so moving on, we have uh, Barbara McLean, who has been the Pond Cove um, Elementary School Administrative Assistant for many, many years. I'm not sure how many, but quite a long time. When my kids were there, she was there. She has chosen to retire. And it's with deep regret that our superintendent Wolfram has um, decided to retire at the end of the school year as well. Um, this will not be the last that we get to honor um, Donna, but there we have it. It's official. <laughs> Can I cry now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. It just means how much I respect her and appreciate her for all she has done. Um, she, will, she will be missed for sure. Um, next, are there any school board agenda requests? Heather, I don't have a request, but were we going to discuss the budget review schedule at any time? 
Yeah, I, I'm, I, um, I don't know. Okay, because <laughs> we aren't ratifying it tonight, but I think it needs to be solidified. And I did have some yep. questions and concerns. Yep. Okay. Um, help me figure out how, how do we best do that? Is that done through um, explaining our desires to Jen about what to take up? Because I did share that information with Jen. Um, yeah, and is it, it okay enough if I just follow up again with that? I think so. There are, just a, there are still some municipal meetings on here that yep. don't pertain to us. Yep, I did notice that too, yeah. really, but I did notice that. So Okay, that's I'll really follow, all it was. Yeah, I'll follow through with that tomorrow to tweet, help tweet that a little bit more. Okay, thanks. Thank, yeah. Um, any other agenda requests or comments? Um, committee reports. Uh, our past meeting is Thursday. So next month, I'll have an um, update for you on that. Policy, Elizabeth? Uh, policy committee did not meet in December. And I imagine I'll be meeting with Donna pretty soon to work out the policy agenda for January, but policy committee will be meeting on the fourth Monday of every month at three o'clock. Okay. Uh, DEI, um, again, our first meeting is tomorrow. So I will have an update next time. Um, it was really great to hear once again, the work that's being done within the buildings as well as district. Um, and I love how, you know, this kind of work is also being supported in the budget through our goals as well. Um, school building committee, um, again, um, there's nothing to report there quite yet. So hopefully by February, we'll have more of an update on that. There are many meetings to be announced. Uh, the task force again is tomorrow at 3.30. PAS is Thursday at 8.30, all via Zoom. Uh, school board training, we have a training that we do annually. Um, it's January 19th, next Tuesday night at 6.30. Mm -hmm. um, it is just to help us understand the role, the role and sort of some of the rules. We have um, Eileen King, is that who's coming again, Donna? Yes. Um, from MSMA is going to come. We last year had her prior to meeting and ran out of time. So we're picking a date so that we have enough time. Um, it's, it's very beneficial um, for new board members as well as refreshers for those who have had it before. Uh, there is a combination school board and town council workshop happening um, January 20th at 6.30. Um, we just wanted to refresh a little bit of the work that happened with Craig Freshly. Um, and in that meeting, we're um, going to talk a little bit about the different roles. Um, and Donna, can you help me? I'm drawing a blank on what we talked about with Matt. Yeah, we're going to just talk, review the, um, the, the school budget um, procedures. That's right. And the town budget procedures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our school board workshop, January 26th is um, written there for budget. Uh, there's a sub finance committee on January 6th um, at 8.30. Again, that is a committee that got started, uh, is it two years ago now? Mm -hmm. um, that's really beneficial. It's helped to the communication between the town and the school board. It is the finance directors of both the town and the school, it's Matt, the um, town manager, as well as our superintendent, Donna. It's both chairs um, and both um, finance chairs. Um, we have the DEI task force. We're meeting twice a month. So our next one will be January 27th at 8.30 and um, school board budget workshop uh, will be uh, January 27th. Oh, that's the if needed. Got it. So um, sometimes these meetings, the one on the 26th may last a little longer. So we have a holding place for the 27th in case it runs over. Note the time on that. It starts at five. That's our long. Yes. Thank you for that. 
Um, and in the past, we have um, had meals that we're not going to obviously do that this year. Maybe we'll give ourselves a 15 minute break to go stretch or whatever, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes or bring some snacks. I don't know. Uh, and then finally, the calendar committee, again, which um, is usually voted on by now, but was delayed by all districts. Um, and I know Donna has met with other superintendents in Cumberland County um, working around the past schedule. And so our first meeting will be January 28th at three o'clock. Um, at this point, um, we're gonna have a movement to move into executive session. Um, we will be returning as a board after that. Um, may I have a motion? I move we enter into executive session pursuant to one MRSA subsection 4056A for the purpose of discussing a personnel item. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome. Uh, Heather Altenberg's a yay. Kimberly Carr's a yay. Yeah. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Volz. Yay. Jennifer McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Um, great. So at this time, um, I suppose, Donna, can you remind me? I, these and all panelists who are not school board members to please leave the meeting. And then and we'll stop record. <laughs> yep. And then you'll start recording when you come back. Yep, I got that piece. So if all attendees, um, Donna, I'm hoping attendees are starting to leave. Sometimes attendees leave and go do things, but keep it running. What happens if they're not actually there to leave? I think you can. Um, Take them out? I think you can. <laughs> I think there's a, a way to lock the room. I think there's a way to. Um, can I remove? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. Do you want to remove Aaron? Yes. Okay. Every day I learn something new. Okay. And I so there are no attendees. Am I is, going to leave? Is there a, does the host have an option to lock the room to prevent other attendees from coming in? Well, I have to let them in. I have to let them. So I'm going to press record. So we are back in the regular business meeting. Um, the next motion consideration as a result of executive session, there is nothing to consider and vote on. So, correct? Okay. Um, Elizabeth, are you nodding at me? It feels about a little weird about? about what I was going to bring up. Yeah, is it what we talked about? Well, I think so. Let's, um, let's, um, all right, let's just do it then. I wasn't planning on voting. I was just gonna appoint Elizabeth as a co-chair um, in this process since, um, as Laura has mentioned, she um, has the most 10 years, she's got the experience. It's obvious that she um, has a lot to offer. Um, and I've been told that it doesn't need to be voted on. I can just appoint it. Um, and so Elizabeth is going to work closely as a co-chair on this process, whatever it turns out to be. Do you accept that appointment, Elizabeth? I do. Okay. Good. I was, um, I was going to wait until after. Sorry, I was confused. That I was too. It, it came out kind of different, but that's fine too. Like that. <laughs> um, thank you, Elizabeth, for being willing to support and help. I really appreciate it. Um, so the next motion, consideration to adjourn. May I have a motion, please? I move we adjourn. <laughs> May I have a second? I second. Uh, Heather Altenberg's yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Cindy Boltz. Yay. Uh, Jen McVeigh. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. All right. Thanks for being here. Thank you, board members, for all your work. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.